Ja, schönen guten Morgen. Mein Name ist Ilya Trojanov. Das ist Teil einer Veranstaltungsreihe Dialektik der Befreiung. Und ähm, es ist eine Kooperation von der Alten Schmiede, in der Sie sich befinden, mit dem Institut von der Wissenschaft des Menschen. Und Sie haben draußen äh, den Programmflyer, äh, in dem Sie das ganze restliche Programm des heutigen Tages noch einsehen können. Am Nachmittag sind noch jede Menge interessante Veranstaltungen, unter anderem zum Beispiel mit Nora Busson, die da hinten in der Ecke sitzt und einen Kaffee trinkt. Also ich lade Sie sehr herzlich ein, am Nachmittag ins Odeon zu kommen, zu einigen Vorträgen, Lesungen und Diskussionen. Ähm, <lacht> der Nachmittag wird merkwürdigerweise auf, überwiegend auf Deutsch stattfinden. Das heißt deswegen Dialektik der Befreiung, weil es vor 50 Jahren in London eine Konferenz, ein Treffen gab von verschiedenen kritischen Denkern, nur eine Denkerin, überwiegend Männer, im Roundhouse in London. Die damaligen Vorträge sind zusammengefasst in diesem Band, der gerade zu dieser Veranstaltungsreihe neu aufgelegt wurde, im Bahö Verlag, Dialektik der Befreiung, liegt auch aus, auch heute Nachmittag im Odeon. So. Good morning, everyone. Ähm, wir haben drei sehr, sehr kenntnisreiche Gäste. Insofern ähm, hoffe ich sehr, dass wir von ihrer, enorm, von ihrer enormen Kenntnis möglichst viel profitieren können heute Morgen. Zu meiner Linken ist Aspen Brinton von, wie ich gerade erfahren habe, oh, sorry, to my left is Aspen Brinton, from, um, originally from Wyoming. Where, where from in Wyoming? Um, a little town called Jackson. Jackson. Up in the okay, Jackson, Wyoming, political scientist, um, theoretist, currently a fellow at the Institute um, Wissenschaft for Menschen. And you've recently published a book that I've just read, Philosophy and Dissidence in Cold War Europe, yep. and which of course is a perfect fit for the theme of our discussion this morning. To your left is Mr. Paul Lentwey, who of course in Vienna and Austria is known to everyone, one of our great journalists and uh, one of the um, most knowledgeable people regarding all things Hungarian, East European and European. Good morning, Mr. Lentwey. And to his left is um, Ivan Kristev, who was born in the same country as I was. Um, were you also born in Sofia? Or? No, in Lukovic. Ah, in Lukovic, okay. I once actually did a story on Lukovic. <laughs> okay. He is um, a fellow at, uh, also at the Institute, um, well-known political scientist. He has uh, uh, recently written a book, which in English I believe is called After Europe. Yeah. In German, uh, as always, slightly more dramatic, <laughs> Europa Dämmerung, published by Zorkamp Verlag, an essay, uh, auch sehr lesenswert und empfehlenswert. Um, 1967, People met in the roundhouse, critical thinkers, Western dissidents. Um, I thought we could start off by describing what the difference was between West and Eastern Europe regarding the threshold year of 68, 67, 68, because evidently it was something quite different in the two blocks. Maybe Mr. Lentwey, if you could start. <coughs> The difference between 57 and no, the now? No, no, the difference between 67, 68 in the 67, West. 67, 68? In the West and in the East of Europe during the Cold War. Well, the difference was probably the luxury of revolt in the West. If one remembers what's happened in France, where the goal said, if I remember it well, one doesn't jail Sartre, doesn't jail Voltaire, when it was about Sartre helping the students. And at the same time, uh, we saw what's happened in Czechoslovakia and elsewhere. And so there was a revolt within the success of the capitalist society in the West, and there was a revolt against the total 
double dictatorship of communism and Russia, which was actually the basic feature in 68. And that was probably also the last flicker of the hope that you can have a kind of socialist democracy you can save something from the original idea of equality and freedom within this system. And this, I think, was anyhow, even for the people in Austria or in Germany and the left who accepted the suppression of the Hungarian revolution, of the Hungarian uprising in 56, 57, there was quite a group of people here in Vienna, too, who then broke with the regime and with communism after 68. So there was a basic difference, I think, in the ideological, political, and personal composition of the people who wanted to save something within the systems and those who revolted against the system, but within the success of that system. That was, I think, the, to my mind, the basic difference. Yeah. Let's start. Listen, having these instruments, it has a disciplining <laughs> effect. Uh, but, uh, uh, no, I, I, I'll try basically uh, to try to get the period 1967 to 1969 was not the same year. 1967, both East and West was speaking, speaking a Marxist jargon when they have been basically attacking the problems of their own society. 1969, it was not the case in Eastern Europe anymore. And I think from this point of view, I can see two, one important similarity and one very fundamental difference, which can be seen even today. In both cases, there was a kind of a new social actor that emerged, and this was the students. The students have been important uh, in the West in the 1967-68, but they were very much important also in the East. The Polish students of March 1968, it was uh, uh, the Czech students, so you have a kind of a new social group for which for the first time uh, got a recognition as a major political actor, so the generational dimension became important. But what I do believe was very much different was in the West 1968-1969, it was very much identifying with people who are not like us. So it was a very kind of a cosmopolitan year in which there was a total fascination with the third world. It was Cuba, for some it was China, it was Vietnam for sure. While in Central and Eastern Europe, 1968 was about national awakening. It was very much about sovereignty. It was about our national culture and our national sovereignty because it was very much in opposition, cultural and political, to the Soviet domination. So from this point of view, I do believe there was a difference. Uh, and as a result of it, basically, of course, uh, there was a slightly different also views on capitalism. Strangely enough, for East Europeans, capitalism was not an issue. First of all, because most of the people a, a did dream, not have a, a dream. No, they didn't have a, it was not a dream yet. It became a dream later. It was not a dream yet, 67, 68. I mean, uh, but it was not an issue because it was just simply something that they had been not very much. While for the, uh, for the West European kind of a left, then anti capitalist sentiment was very strong. And I do believe all this basically ended with in the 1970s, where famously when Bukowski. Uh, was landing in Paris because he was exchanged uh, for the leader of the Ch uh, Ch Chilean Communist Party, and he was asked on the airport, uh, are you coming from the left or on the right? He said, I'm not coming from the left-wing camp or the right-wing camp, I'm coming from a concentration camp. Uh, so this was basically, I do believe, uh, how all this ended, yeah. But there seems to be a similarity, Aspen, and you read about it in your book, that there was a dream of a third path or a third way <coughs> which was formulated by at least, let's say, 68, by quite a number of leading East European intellectuals, um, especially in then Czechoslovakia, Poland. Um, and this, would, this is similar in a way to what these people in, in London, 67, Marcuse, and, and many other thinkers yeah. were, were trying to come up with. So again, neither communism yeah. nor capitalism, but something else. 
Could you maybe describe that within the East European framework? Yeah, no, I think, I think you've read correctly that the, the first place I would go would be more with similarities than with differences. Um, in Marcuse's an, uh, um, essay for this um, conference in 1967, um, he really um, tries to draw the relationship between sort of systems of totality um, and those sort of dialectically trying to resist them. Um, and there I think I see the bridge definitely between the, the student movement. Um, the students, I definitely agree with Yvonne, are, are, are a big new actor in this case. The student movement um, and their relationship to the universities in America, um, which Marcuse is involved in. Um, if you saw the film yesterday, um, you know, battling the University of California, um, and a kind of system of totality, of course, with a lot more political military might behind it in the East, um, and, uh, uh, and that sort of um, suppression over the top, producing a kind of resistance from below that is articulated in a third way sense. Um, and it's just a deep suspicion, I think, on both sides of you know, communism on one extreme and capitalism on the other extreme. The military industrial complex was the term used in the United States. Um, and that um, was itself, you know, a, a complex totalizing system structure, which the, the dissidents and, the, and the, the student activists in the US saw as repressing them. And similarly, in the, in the Eastern European case, I mean, you have the, the Soviet and the communist apparatus. Um, and what's sort of bubbling up in 68, um, the counterculture in the US and the kind of dissident movements around 68 um, is, is, is cultural and, and to, to some degree nationalistic as well. So that the, the suppression of culture becomes one of the deep frustrations of those who, who are trying to, trying to resist that totalizing structure. I don't agree uh, totally with Ivan about uh, the national issue because you see that was for instance in Yugoslavia which played in those days a key role uh, showing that perhaps one finds a third way uh, that was actually the, the peak of the solidarity when Yugoslavia came out against the invasion and everything and Tito was tra traveling around and it was actually the moment when all those um, very very important um, contradictions, hatred, which later came to the fore, was still under the Yugoslav, all Yugoslav solidarity hidden. The other thing, which is also perhaps not unimportant, particularly if one looks at today's Eastern Europe, that in, in Poland, 68 was also the year when uh, the uh, pro Soviet and communists um, discovered the mobilizing sources of racial hatred and anti-Semitism. That was the moment when uh, the Mochar faction in the Polish Communist Party started the anti-Zionist campaign, thereby helping very much Western universities because from Kolakowski, Bruce, onward, some of the best minds came out from Poland and also in uh, Czechoslovakia. So it was actually, it was actually a, a, a tendency which showed in those days how you can mobilize still racial hatred behind the curtain of the proletarian solidarity. Then came, of course, also, it was always there, the national issue, of course. That was the, the basic issue later. But there were tendencies which were very worrying and which we see that they haven't died. Uh, I agree. Uh, j just to give you uh, where, in a certain way, it was not by accident that the communist government in Poland went on to the anti-Semitic campaign. Because the reason students in March 1968 went on the street was because of a famous Mitskevich play was censored because of the sensitivity on the Russia issue. So the problem was how to define what it means to be a Polish patriot. And for these students' opposition to be a Polish patriot was we are standing for our tradition we are not basically going to make a compromises with the political correctness of the moment, which was not attacking the Russians. 
So then, basically, the Polish communist government decided to come to a different source of what it means to be a Polish patriot, and this was the anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm saying this because I do believe this is quite important. It's not that they have been nationalists, neither Michnik nor others, but I do believe because sovereignty issue was at the center of it. And this was true, I do believe, also in Czechoslovakia, where in 1967-68, you have a turn to national culture. It could be the liberal tradition, but our culture is something more than basically the internationalist discourse, which was the official discourse uh, of the Communist Party. So from this point, we're talking about dialectics. It was an interesting dialectics of how you're defining what is a nationalism. There was an important book in 1970s written by nobody else than Huntington, who when he goes back to the crisis of 1960s, 97, and creating the Eastern Europe with the United States, he said there was something interesting. He said in America, the students were protesting against the system, but using the ideals of the system. They said there is a difference between the ideal of what America should be and how it is. And he said even in the Soviet bloc, when people started first to attack, it was from the point of view of the ideals of the system. I do believe that at the end of this cycle, this was the last time people went on the street, even intellectually applying that what you want is a better type of socialism or third way and so on. So from this point of view, 60, 1968 started kind of in a similar way, east-west. It ended differently. Well, let's maybe just focus um, on, on re-emerging, re-emergence of nationalism. It's so important nowadays. Um, I always thought that nationalism was in a way a rebellion against communism. Yeah. But I, I recently read a text by Yuri Sleskin, who says something very interesting that led me to completely new thoughts, that he says that actually the communist system produced, especially in the Soviet Union, produced national entities, which then gave birth to nationalistic dynamics. So in a way, they were below the veneer of um, the, the rhetorics of internationalism. Actually, they themselves kind of constructed the building blocks of, the, of coming nationalism. How would you react to that theory or this thesis? I think the basic issue was when nationalism, quote, infected, unquote, the party itself. When the party, for instance, in Yugoslavia, because of the, of the structure of the country, became the carrier of the nationalist uh, and uh, ideas and interests, because behind it was also the interest. And uh, the Soviet Union was, of course, a, a, a special issue, if you want to say, put it so, that there were also the republics, but basically uh, there was absolutely no freedom uh, for the republics, and we could see now the consequences how Khrushchev much later with the Crimea and the Ukraine and so on. So I think it was uh, definitely underestimated. And it is one of the very curious features in uh, the history of the, ide of the ideological history that despite all the basic changes, basic contra differences between communism and social democracy, the social democrats also traditionally underestimated the strength and the explosive force of nationalism. Yeah, I, I think I would respond to that first with a question whether the Eastern European states were of the same model as the Soviet republics. I mean, again, this seems like something that, that was really part of the USSR to, to, um, to promote that kind of policy. And the, the Eastern European countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, had an autonomy before um, the communist experiment that, um, that, that perhaps is important to remember in this context. But I also think on the on the issue of culture, I agree. Um, you know, the the initial sort of socialist ideal or the communist ideal underestimated what culture was. Um, and I think there were real human beings sort of seeing this and responding to this within the communist systems themselves and realizing they needed to co-opt some of that culture um, in order to um, to solidify their power um, in in a certain kind of basic way. Um, and that underestimation sort of probably led to some kind of reaction. I'll very much go to the difference between the Soviet and East European experience. First, Soviet Union came in the moment in which self-determination and basically 
sovereignty was at the center of the world's agenda. It was Wilson time, everybody was saying the empires have been collapsing. So paradoxically, Soviet Union managed to preserve the Russian empire by basically giving the idea and the impression of the self-determination for the republics. And some of these republics, they didn't have very much a nationalism before because there was not a strong state tradition in most of these states, particularly in Central Asia and others. So you have this type of a double thing going together. On one level, nationalism is something from the past. And the Soviet man is not going to have a nationality. Uh, on the other side, in order to basically keep with this demand for self-determination, they started to create it, and in my view this is quite important, and I do believe that also Yuri Sleskin has it very much, the legitimacy of the local <coughs> elites, of the local elites started very much to be rooted in this type of a new nationalism which was sanctioned from above, which means that even on the level of the structures, always the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet republics was ethnic national, number two was Russian. It's never going to be number one being the Russian. Uh, Eastern Europe was slightly different, and it was slightly different nevertheless that East European countries differ, because there is one thing that happened in Eastern Europe, and in my view have a long-term consequences uh, that people not very much reflect on, was the demographic change in East European countries that came as the result of the end of the World War II. Many of the Central and East European countries have been demographically much more multi-ethnic and multicultural before the war. I'm always giving the Polish example. In 1939, almost 32% of the population of Poland were non-Poles. There were Germans, there was Ukrainians, there were Jews. After the war, more than 92% had been Poles. So, and this was country by country. Of course, Hungary was a very special case for different reasons. But you have a very strong ethnic homogenization. And this type of ethnic homogenization in Eastern Europe is becoming critically important because during the communist period, uh, what East Europeans learn is that to be in a normal state is just to live with people like you. Uh, one of the interesting things that happens, and I remember it also very well from my personal experience, listen, speaking a foreign language, for a young person in the 70s and 80s was a huge exception. This was not true for the previous generations. For example, in Bulgaria... Except for Russian. Yeah, yeah but OK. They, they, you much more understand. You have this rosification, but listen, normally, if you don't go to the higher kind of a strata university and so on, the Russian was passive. This is the way, because they're not so. But before it, you're going to have Bulgarians understanding some Turkish, probably some Greek. It was not a kind of a high level, but it was a typical imperial legacy. You speak, or at least you pretend that you understand certain languages. And then uh, comes the 60s and 70s with the idea of the one language citizen. You're right on Russian. Bulgaria was very particular on this because we have a day of Russian television. It was on Fridays and so on. You cannot have this in Poland. Uh, and you don't have this in Hungary. So from this point of view, the Russification was there, but Russification was much more on the level of the elites. It was the Latin language of the communist system. But when you go to the public, basically, for the first time, people didn't have a need to speak more than their national language. It was not perceived as a kind of a major advantage because also people stopped to travel. The only migration, which was, by the way, massive and important, was from the villages to the cities. But cross-border travel, of course, was highly problematic. I, I don't think that this uh, comparison with Soviet Union, Eastern Europe is um, totally right, because you don't forget quarter of a century history of the Soviet Union, when in Eastern Europe, with the partial exception of Czechoslovakia, there were semi-authoritarian regimes, etc but totally different. And there is also one basic difference. In Eastern and Central Europe, Bulgaria is a great exception, um, in the same way as the Yugoslav history, the various <coughs> nations, that the Communist Party was traditionally strongest in Yugoslavia, in Montenegro and uh, Macedonia. And in these countries, the Communist parties were led not by native, quote, unquote, uh, revolutionaries, but primarily what you said about Poland, 
uh, which I wouldn't agree 100%, where there were many three, and the, three million Jews, but many of them were uh, Poles and regarded themselves as Poles. Some of them were the greatest poets in those days. But uh, I would simply say that the communist parties in Romania, in Hungary, in, uh, in uh, Poland, were led by people who were either Ukrainians or other nationalities, Jews, etc., or revolutionaries, because basically that was also the question after the um, diktat of Trianon, Saint Germain, etc., that in the states which were status quo states, which won territories, they wanted to keep them. And in the other countries, that was the greatest single source of strength for these regimes. They were the revisionists, like even in Bulgaria, San Stefano. But this was there. And so this is also one of the key features of the difference between the Soviet uh, history and the East European history, quite apart from the fact of the time factor. This is a very important point because I do believe that one thing that happened just after the end of the World War II was that the leadership of the Communist Party, which was very much coming from minorities, Anna Parker in Romania, it could be Jewish, it could be others, then it's not by accident that the anti-Jewish purges started in the Communist parties in 1940s and others. This was the moment in which all of the parties started to be led by the majority nationals. Uh, this is when Gergiu Gersh, uh, Desh came in Romania and others, because the problem was that uh, in order to control the state, you were looking for a certain type of a national legitimacy in order not to allow basically the nationalism to be used against the minorities. And nevertheless, that in the pre-war period, the Communist Party has been dominated by people who are not coming from the major nation after the power was taken this was very much changed. Uh, Yugoslavia is a very particular case because in Yugoslavia, the Communist Party has the legitimacy of winning power of their own. They didn't, Tito did not depend on the Soviet army taking power in the way anybody else, so the legitimacy of the Communist power was totally different. It was totally, totally different. different. Totally different. So you mentioned early on, Ivan, um, after 69, Marxism was out. I remember I spent some time in the 80s in Paris, and there were a lot of East European <coughs> immigrants there. And I, I remember an elderly gentleman from Poland telling me, only half in jest, well, the only Marxists left are at the Sorbonne. And um, your book, Aspen, actually describes, one could say, a kind of after-Marxism search by leading intellectuals, leading dissident intellectuals, in order to come up with a both social and personal <coughs> um, form of rebellion, of identity, reassertion, without using kind of the, the rhetorical framework that was dominant. And uh, is, that, is that, my first question would be, is that a result of the change of state power? You say at some point that it is, in parentheses, is soft power, so it means that there was a lot of brutal repression in the 50s and 60s. That kind of, you write about it in your most recent book, um, the Kada system as a typical example. It was more about <coughs> social control, mind control. So of course, dissidents had to react to that. They had to come up with their own forms of rebellion. Right, I, I think one of the things I saw going on in the text of the dissidents as I, as I read them philosophically was this kind of nostalgia for what is in Marx a humanistic quality, right? The idea that you can overcome the economy in such a way that you can um, become a more f fully flourishing human being and sort of have a kind of um, sort of social and community-based um, sense of equality that, that brings a kind of mutual recognition um, between groups of people. Um, and that that kind of nostalgia was, was leading, I think, in the case of, of many intellectuals like Havel and Patochka doing sort of philosophy seminars underground um, <coughs> with small groups and small communities to a kind of civic associationalism um, that, um, that gave them a sense of mutual recognition between each other. Now, the legacy of Marx in that, I, I think sometimes I've said this, is you know, if um, Marx flipped Hegel on his head, part of what some of the dissidents was doing was trying to sort of flip Marx back to a bit more Hegel, um, which is to say that there's 
um, again, that culture and civic community component that's so strong in Hegel um, being, um, being one of the important aspects of gathering people together to, to encourage a kind of dissent against a power structure that's so overwhelming um, that, that to even um, confront it is this really existentially daunting tax task. So one of the questions I ask in the book is, well, how do you overcome this, this great sense of um, alienation that, that, that the, these kind of um, states give you? Um, and that, that that sense of civic community and building an equality of recognition um, is, is this sort of turn back to Hegel and towards the humanism of Marx together. Um, it's not really philosophically pure, but it's kind of interesting sort of confrontation of, uh, towards, towards a difficult situation. But you also point out that there's a return to kind of pre-enlightenment ideals all the way back to Socrates, that this concept, yes. this <clears throat> idea that you have to first understand yourself, you have to find yourself, you have to construct right. yourself in order then to have social and political impact. No, I, I definitely think that's the case. And, and in Marcuse's essay, actually, the 1967 essay, um, he says, you know, there, there are these three forms of dialectics that we, we need to return to. One of them is Platonic, the other one's Hegelian, and the third is Marxism. Um, and I think there the, the Platonic sort of turn in the cave, right, the idea of, you know, um, that we all are as Plato's cave chained in front of a set of images that are produced by the state or produced by um, the media or produced by various um, sort of entities that are more powerful than ourselves and that, that we're chained to these, right? One of the Platonic dialectics is to turn, to get yourself turned around through, through a sense of knowledge and through a sense of self-knowledge um, and that, that they're um, these small dissident communities that I wrote about in the book are trying to do that. Um, and they often called it anti-politics, right? They said, well, it's not political, it's just about us. It's about our, um, our sort of living in truth towards a kind of existential truth and we're gonna pull away from politics. Of course, in the end, it ended up being implicitly very political because of the structure of the state over them. Um, and so that this, um, uh, my argument about recognition in the book sort of comes back to this, that you need to have this sense of, of, of recognition between communities of people as a sort of pre-political entity to it. Um, so. But there we have a similarity then now between the dissidents of the East and the dissidents yes. of the West, because yeah. 68 you had this famous saying, the personal is political. Right. And uh, yeah. of course, most of the articles, most of the essays in this book actually make a very similar point. Right. I mean, I mean, they do. I, th I think in Marcuse's um, argument there. I mean, I just sort of took a took a note. He said, "Well, there's a dimension underneath the material base, right?" I mean, I mean, uh, Marcuse is um, a fairly good Marxist, but there he's he's doing something else, right? That um, the material base isn't enough to understand that there's some sort of existential or um, a sort of deeper question about our our humanity that that is at stake first, and the, and then political economy comes later. So that. That ordering of the Platonic dialectic to the Hegelian dialectic to the Marxist dialectic is almost a prioritization. Okay, right? Um, the, the, the Marxism comes third. Right? Yeah. Well, he he is a good <laughs> Marxist, but he has anarchist emotions. So in, yes. in a way that plays anarchist against. Anarchist emotions. That's a nice phrase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's very interesting what you said uh, um, about uh, Paris. Your experiences. It was one of the curious features of the entire situation that Marxism was read, Marx, much more in the West than in the East, and uh, Marxism and Marx became an instrument of trying to have a kind of liberalization. In Hungary, Georg Lukács, the disciple, or for instance in Yugoslavia, we were in Korchula <coughs> about the praxis group, you know, about the philosophy which was, of course, uh, which were all fringe groups, basically, and they were swept away by the nationalist currents. And when it came to the merger between the party leaderships, fighting for the survival and using the national issue. And that was, of course, with Marxism, I, one of my first uh, articles in, 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 in Monat, the famous German monthly like encounter, which most people already forgot, was that really you could hardly see Marx, it was Stalin, 
and the particularly brave people even had some Lenin, you know, but that was yeah. Marx was very much... Was in done in 80 pages, which yes, were learned by heart. It was yeah. summarized everything. Yeah. You knew everything about the world, if you rest. Uh, but I do believe it's interesting, because after 1968, in different countries, and from this point of view, by the way, the idea of the dissident is very much a post-1968 phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting, because in different countries, it took different forms. In Soviet Union, it became much more a kind of a ethical term, which was post-ideological. It went very much on the level of the personal behavior and personal choices. It was not using neither Marxism, not a kind of a strong ideological language. The idea was living in truth. And this was very much in Poland. And this is interesting because Kulakowski from this point is interesting because the East-West negotiations of what is left, what is socialism, in my view, ended with the famous G.P. Thompson, Kulakovsky discussion, uh, where basically you see how Kulakovsky, who was expelled from Poland after 1968, started not simply, uh, he simply lost interest in Marxism after a certain period of time, being the famous historian of Marxism, started to be interested in other things. But in Poland, the dissidents never lost an interest in the working class. And this is quite interesting. From this point of view, the Marxism as a major language, the Marxism as a utopian dimension, was probably was not there. But the avant-garde role of the working class and the importance of the working class was still there. So people like Kuron, particularly, and others, have been very much insisting on this and saying intelligentsia should go to the people. So then come the idea of the uh, kind of uh, anti-politics, understanding as a, we should live as if the communist state is not there. We probably cannot overcome it because of the geopolitical situation, but the idea of the parallel society, and it's quite interesting why I'm saying that it's different. In Soviet Union, it was about individual. Me as an individual should live as the communist as if it does not exist. In Poland was we as a society. Uh, and, and then comes the Czech Republic, where I very much agree with you. There was a return to a kind of a much more humanistic tradition, which was not so much basically, which was a pre-Marxist and Patochka and others. But it was interesting because if 1968, 69 was much more similar against Eastern Europe, the aftermath became very different in different places. And I'm not touching on Yugoslavia, which was also in a kind of a slightly different way, also because people can travel much more, which was a major difference, yeah. But of course, Marxism has no monopoly on syndicalism. Yeah. So basically, organizing workers to fight for their Absolutely. rights is part of a much larger yeah. movement than, than Marxism. Yeah. So I think it makes total sense that Solidarność would Absolutely. come out of a, a very old European yeah. tradition of. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you when we compare the East and the West, everybody now talks about the post factual age as if it started uh, one year ago. Um, but from an from a East European perspective, and your book is, a lot of, uh, of your book is about that. Um, the famous, Havel's famous saying, I, uh, living in truth. And of course, it was also a rebellion with all the differences that you men mentioned, Ivan, but all these people rebelled against an ideology of, let's say, um, doublethink or an ideology of limited um, or instrumentalized truth. Um, so in a way, this is a kind of, um, this is a positioning against post-factuality avant la lettre, long before the yeah. West discovered yeah. it. No, definitely. I, th I think in the last year, I, I, I've heard lots of echoes. And I thought, I, I've, I've heard this before. I've read this before. I've, um, in a sense, um, thought through it because um, it's some of it's proper some of it's at the level of propaganda. Um, you know, state institutions producing things that people know are propaganda. But I think when you read Havel's essay, um, Power of the Powerless, and the, the famous example of you know, putting a sign in the window just to be left alone, um, to say workers of the world unite, um, there's so many other examples of that now coming out. You know, how do you, um, you um, defer to an authority just to be left alone? Or you create a story, or you, um, you, you twist the truth, or you pretend things are not happening. Um, in order to, to avoid politics in a certain sort of way. And so I think the, the lessons from Eastern Europe are, are very relevant now to this. And there, there's many people out there writing about it um, at this point, because it does sort of speak to this, this sort of strange idea that um, things start to become true merely because the person um, who is speaking them has a lot of power. 
Um, and so the, 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 the baseline power structure determining the truth, if, if you're able to see that and sort of recognize that you know, um, the, the repetition of an untruth by someone powerful turns it into a truth in quotation marks, um, we, that, I mean, that already happened in, in Eastern Europe in a lot of cases. I agree, but I do believe that there is one small difference today which is quite important. Communists had a propaganda and monopolized claiming that there is a truth and they represent it. So from this point of view, you are basically going against it simply saying the truth, people that see, which know that there is no truth. Now you have a manipulation by people who said there is no truth. And I do believe this is slightly different. Basically saying, listen, everybody has his own stories. Probably I'm not right, but others. Is, is that really the case? Does Breitbart say there is no truth? For example, Breitbart, I'm not going to claim. But I do believe, for example, no, if, example. if you see, but, uh, if, because of course, uh, Russian propaganda in the West is one of the stories. They don't claim that they have the truth. They said probably we're lying like everybody else. We have our point of view, everything is just ideology and so on. So from this point of view, uh, this is much more difficult to oppose because what has not, what was common is the lies that have been presented in truth. What is the difference, the consequence of saying a truth? For example, people like Havel believe that it is enough to say the truth and all this system is going to collapse. Uh, now when somebody said, okay, so it's your point of view, fine. I'm fine with this, so what else? I do believe here is kind of a difference. Well, well I think the difference is that there was a dichotomy then. There yeah. was an antagonism, while yeah. now you have a pluralism of lies. Exactly. And, and therefore it becomes yeah. more complicated. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, there is one <coughs> statement by Kafka, which I can recall only in German, and uh, wouldn't like to translate it. Es gibt nur eine Wahrheit, die ist aber lebendig und hat deshalb ein ständig wechselndes Gesicht. <laughs> there is only one truth, but it is alive and therefore it has a permanently changing uh, face. Uh, face. Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, I agree, I mean, but there is a fantastic line of continuity. Uh, first of all, I agree 100% is the individuals. This is something in general. One always underestimates in politics, I feel, at the top, the role of the personalities. I try to discuss it in my latest book and some other essays. But there is also the importance of personalities at the level of dissidence and the accidents that a person like Zakharov or, or in the Russian history, which were actually isolated, like in Hungary, or in Poland, there were groups. And this is, of course, the collective, the solidarity is, of course, something very, very important. And it is also a great difference between the two. And then is another question, which is now plays a very great role, that's the media and the modern communications, too, that unfortunately it is not spirit, but the stupidity which is spread and the danger that you can't have a meaningful discourse. So the fringes become even more isolated than before. But well, let's quick, quick uh, hang on to this idea of um, continuity. Um, what you just said reminded me of something a Bulgarian author colleague told me just a few, uh, a few weeks back. He said that we learned during the communist times to leave conviction at home, and we found out that it still serves the purpose because there's absolutely, you're not going to have a career, you're not going to be successful if you carry your conviction into your working place. So there again, basically, a certain strategy of um, kind of dividing the personal and the political realm has served people well in post-89 Eastern Europe. And, and isn't that part of the problem, kind of um, more than what some people discuss as a continuity of repression, you know, people being afraid, people being timid. Anyone? <laughs> um, I, I, I would just, I mean, the, the term that comes to mind when you describe that is self-censorship, right? So that the, the forms of self-censorship which occur um, in different cultures and societies are going to be, I think, um, persistent, um, but they're not going to look exactly the same in each sort of case. Um, I think it was the case of the civil rights movement in the U.S. as well as um, 
as well as the, this kind of argument that um, the, the way in which you can catch yourself undertaking some kind of self-censorship is not necessarily obvious, so that the, the actual process of discussion and to meeting in groups and to, to being a dissident was in part what made those people special was that they could see themselves doing this. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't in a sense automatic, um, so that there was an education aspect to being able to understand the way you self-censor your, yourself, like, like if, if, you, if you think it's automatic, um, you often do it automatically without knowing you're doing it. Um, and so that that was one of, I think, Havel's points, um, that people did it so automatically that they didn't question it. Um, and so that the questioning of it becomes a, a necessary kind of education, educative, educating aspect of, of the dissidents. I mean, that's just sort of one very unspecific thought, but. I, I very much agree with, uh, with, uh, with the question, because when 1989 came, the general idea was if only people start talking publicly what they're saying in their kitchen, they're going to be democracy and they're going to be freedom. But you know, first they're different kitchens. <laughs> and secondly, in kitchen, people also say quite nasty things about each other. Uh, and from this point of view, I do believe that there was, the dissident community was always a community. It's very difficult. Being a dissident on your own, it exists, but it's a very difficult story. Because in a certain way, this was also a kind of a community very much based on peer pressure which does not allow you to make a compromises that otherwise you'll do. This is very much seeing your behavior, how you're going to see by these people for, him, for whom you have high respect. And this is why certain people manage uh, to survive with their non-conformist behavior, because they wanted basically to stay up to the expectations of this small group. And basically, this was the kitchen that they had in mind. But then comes the normal kitchens in which you have a lot of envy, uh, kind of a lot of uh, small talk. I was always, for example, when you see the tabloid media today, I start to have a theory that the number of basically reporting on other people never changed. But simply what before you had been reporting to the police, now you're reporting to the tabloid media. <laughs> Who is basically sleeping with whom? Who is getting what and others? So from this point of view, this idea of exposing others is very much staying in society, but then basically you're just doing this to power. Now you go directly to the sovereign. Uh, because I, was, uh, I never had basically time, but I do believe it's going to be interesting to compare some of the type of reports. And I'm talking now much more about the reports which people voluntarily was writing to power than the, basically the professional agents. For example, my friend, he bought an apartment, how he can have this and that. and that. To, with what you basically see as the exposure in some of the tabloid media. Because this type of story, in my view, became quite important. Uh, why, nevertheless, that you do not have this classical repression, that you don't have this, it's not clear what you should say these days. It does not mean that people are going to speak their mind. This cynicism and instrumental use of your conviction is continuing, but with a very different logic, because you also start to fear different things. You start to basically position yourself very much strategically, what I'm going to gain or what I'm going to lose if I'm going to saying this to that. Because talking about Sakharov, listen, he was individual, and at the same time, no. There is a story which I always find fascinating, and this is what I'm going to say. As you know, at some point, he was uh, deprived of all the uh, medals that he had. He was a hero of the socialist uh, labor, and so on. He was one of the persons who made the bomb. So there was a famous uh, cocktail party organized for the end of the World War One by Politburo. It's the highest level. And everybody goes on these parties with all the medals that they have. And in the Soviet times, you can imagine, basically, people with kind of levels. So other Soviet academician, very famous one, he went, and in his jacket, there was nothing. And everybody knew that he had all these medals. They said, but comrade, this and that, where is your medals? And he said, do you know what? I forgot my jacket, so I borrowed the jacket of Academician Sakharov. <laughs> and this was such a powerful kind of a level of solidarity, basically. So you have this. You have a small group of people for which this type of behavior matters, and this motivates you to do this. And today, I think this is the, perhaps the basic difference, also in the atmosphere in Eastern Europe, let alone here, is that idealism is replaced by total cynicism. 
And this is what I feel also in the discourse and, and uh, incredible that, that uh, people don't discuss the basic issues but uh, leave their convictions, if they had any, at home. I mean, uh, it is a total change in, and also I think it is terribly important to realize that the people who were trying to change the things and then change their minds and were looking for the most human sources and ways were always a tiny minority, tiny minority. And today, with the communication revolution, Facebook, etc., you are you can't really have a meaningful discourse about such issues. So I think this is perhaps one of the most uh, worrying phenomenon for me at any rate. Now I completely agree, but uh, let's try and analyze the reason for the cynicism because uh, it's very evident in Bulgaria. Um, now, what, one of the things you you don't actually discuss in your book, Ivan, is. Um, one of the reasons that, that I would suggest is continuity of elites, at least in, in the case of Bulgaria. People keep saying, well, the same people are in power. It's a kind of a class society. The nomenclature has become a new oligarchy, um, to put it very simply. Um, therefore, the simple human being, namely I, we, I don't have a chance. My children don't have a chance. Therefore, what is there to fight for? What is there to aim for? There's kind of no societal ideal because the only thing they can see is the small elite that has everything and the rest of society. Is, isn't that one of the, the reasons for the predominance of cynicism? For sure. Uh, listen, this is also what you can see very much strongly in the appeal of some of uh, the populist parties in power. For example, Mr. Kuczynski, who is not a corrupt politician, so this is not Orban. He basically said this was a betrayed revolution. It was a stolen revolution. And this is quite interesting, because the major story is where the legitimacy of a political change comes from. The freedom, or basically the better opportunities that you have, or the feeling that those that have been in power before have been destroyed. From this point of view, the interesting story about 1989 was this was a revolution, but it was a revolution that was very much shaped by the memories of the communist revolution where the whole elite was destroyed. So the idea was this time it's not about replacing people, destroying people, we want to integrate everybody. And this is why the idea of the peaceful revolution was so important and this is why for a certain period of time this idea has a popular support. Could and, you explain, because I yeah. think Marcuse, for example, yeah. would challenge yeah. Um, that it was a revolution. Could you explain yeah. why, why was the revolution? Because everybody yeah. keeps repeating it. No, no, listen, uh, for sure. And uh, the most interesting, uh, there was a different idea. By the way, these days, defining what is a revolution is a major issue because many people, and I do believe Marcuse including, is going to say that the absence of violence, I mean the violent change, is already disqualifying this is a revolution. The radical nature of the change is going to be seen differently. Uh, but this, how, how this change came, by the way, this is quite interesting. Historically, People now don't talk it very much, but uh, the change in Eastern Europe come very much in the middle of the celebration and anniversary of the 200 years of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was basically when you were celebrating, and this comes very much from people like Fure and others, was can you decouple the idea of a radical political change from the idea of the terror and violence that came after it? So the idea of lack of violence was very important, by the way, also very important for some of the dissident tradition. But when you basically have the lack of violence, when basically you're going to have a change much more based to integrating all the elites than not, then after five or 10 years, the question said, change for whom? And then people said, if it was a liberation, it was the liberation of the elites. The best book from this point of view, in a certain way, I do believe, is Stephen Kotkin's book, The Uncivil Society, <laughs> who basically he said, first, the 1989 was very much the choice of the elites and not the people. He said the biggest protests in 1989 took the places where there was no civil society. The only countries in which there was a civil society, Poland, didn't went on the streets. In the streets went the Czech, the East Germans, Bulgarians, basically, where there was no counter elite, there was no organization, and so on. So as a result of it, people basically start to look there, and the level of the cynicism is, it's not a change. Everything was just the 
the political power have been transformed into economic power. We have been cheated. And when you have the feeling that you are cheated, your response is, if they cheated me, I'm going to cheat them. And from this type of a cynicism, which was also typical for the communist period, how you're doing this, is doing it very much. And from this point of view, I'm doing this. So this is, in my view, this is very important to understand, particularly places like Poland. For many different reasons, Hungary is slightly more complicated case. But in Poland, Mr. Kaczynski never changed his views. So from this point of view, he's much more like Mr. Corbyn than a kind of an opportunistic politician. He stays where he stays. He was very strongly against the round table negotiations. He believes that basically the solidarity elite in uh, for the cost of peace uh, betrayed the revolution. On the other side, 1989 was very much also rooted in the experience of 1968. Yeah. The idea of the Soviet tanks coming in 1956 was very strong in the imagination of particularly the Polish political elite, which was had the real negotiations and so on. So I do believe that, strangely enough, now nobody talks about the role of violence. But in 1967, the idea of a non-violent revolution was not going to make sense. People can disagree with the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is totally different. But the idea of the transformative nature of violence, in my view, was a very strong idea and it was already in the 1970s and 80s when they start to disappear. Uh, and if you're not going to have violence, if basically you're going to have this type of a change, uh, the famous saying uh, in Eastern Europe was, we wanted justice, we got the rule of law. Uh, and I, from this point of view, the best characteristics of 1989, that there was not people being killed for political reasons, became the major kind of a vulnerability and source of illegitimacy of the political change. At least this is kind of going to be That's my interpretation. It's, uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's, it's, uh, but at the same time, there was this difference, of course. In the countries we didn't know the real change, there were the people on the streets. And in those countries which already went through, like Hungary and Poland, 56 or 81, there wasn't. But basically, the net result was that the so-called <coughs> demonstrations, uprising, opposition, was then, quote, stolen in the same way by the elite or the parts of the elite which survived, like in Hungary or in Poland. So this was not a great dif It even was a more striking contrast in Romania, for instance, or I think in Bulgaria too, but, but in Romania that it ha happened within the communist top leadership that Ceausescu was uh, deposed. And then the same people, up to this day, some of them are running the country or fighting each other. And uh, this is also true of the different countries. And I think it's very important when you talk about the criminality and the power battle, the tradition, the tradition of the corruption the tradition of this ingrained corruption, which to my mind was very interesting. It was different in Bulgaria. It was more egalitarian in the 30s or in the 20s than, let's say, Hungary or, or Poland. But, but you have the same tendencies how this was then instrumentalized, of course. Kaczynski and Orban and so on, and it strikes a bell, it strikes a chord at the people like Trump. I mean, it is not that kind of incredible situation that they come with their own planes, but this is, of course, the incredible situation that this, quote, simple, unquote, people support those who betray the elementary decency and the traditions for which people were fighting and even died. So, so j just one point, uh, which is a footnote, but very, in a certain way, 1989 was very much thought in Marxist terms, because the idea 19? was 1989, if you're going to change the economic base, you're changing society. Because the privatization was basically perceived as the core of the change. You're changing property, and when you're going to have a private property, it doesn't matter who owns it. Uh, in the 1990, 1991, it aren't was... You, aren't you um, putting an uh, intellectual cover on a, I think, very brutal um, positioning of the elites? Basically, I, I didn't think they were thinking of change. They were just thinking no, no, how but from outside, to 
how to rob society. This is true, but why the West basically bought it? And I do believe when I'm saying it was very much the West, the West. Yeah, uh, the Western interpretation of this was the following. What really matters is to change the economic base. And this is why. Sure, but out of self interest, not out yeah. of an idea of uh, no, transformation. No, no, but there were people who probably believe it that because the idea is what you understand is at the heart of the communist project. If you believe that at the heart is basically the nationalized economy, you believe that moment you're going to privatize it's over. And you have a self interest how it was basically done locally, but from outside, most of the advisors who went, probably some of them were not cynical. They simply believe it. Uh, and I, uh, I very much agree that this was critical because you changed the property. By the way, this is also an interesting story, just giving a concrete story. There was countries in which early in the process, there was a certain level of decommunization. For example, like the Czech Republic, is Germany. And then you countries like Bulgaria, which it never happened. If you see the electoral behavior of the public, you're not going to see a major differences. Basically, how the East Germany is voting these days, for whom and so on, is not going to be very different in the way, for example, Bulgaria is voting. One of the interesting stories that you do know, don't know in these changes who is the winner and who is the loser. For example, in Bulgaria, very early on, the only people that have been expelled from the secret services was people coming from the classical political police, and people who had never been touched was the military intelligence. As a result of it, people from the political police ended up as being one of the richest people in the country because very early on they basically totally reformulated their strategies like a market strategies because they cannot get certain positions and others. The military intelligence stayed much longer in the institutions, <laughs> <laughs> so they ended much more kind of a poorer uh, uh, in individual terms. So one also of the interesting story of the transition was not simply that certain type of elites were preserved, but what kind of capital really matters. And the capital which matters most was also having the relations with the West. For example, people having being part of the foreign intelligence, having business contacts and others. Yeah. So from this Which, point- Which, by the way, started already in the 80s. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So from this point of view, it's interesting to see the difference. It is not simply that the old hierarchies have been translated immediately, symmetrically after this, but certain type of positions that looks not very important before. For example, commercial attaché in Vienna can end up to be extremely important and powerful position in 19, Vienna or Berlin or anywhere else. But so from this point of view, it's, it's also an interesting inter-elite story of what kind of a capital was the one that really gives you. And, and this but survived, the, yes. Yeah, yeah but before we, we get too depressed, um, <laughs> Aspen, well, I, I, I wanted to, sorry, or did you want to say something about that? No, no, I was just on the cynicism question. Where we no, exactly, that, I wanted yeah. to ask you, is, yeah. to combat cynicism, is yeah. there a heritage of the dissident movement that is still alive, um, or that could serve as a motivation for, for future right. rebellion? Uh, Possibly, and, and, and I think the answer to that question has a lot to do with what this term civil society has come to mean. It's come out of the dissident tradition to some degree in the East. Um, but I think what's not necessarily been a word on the table, which should be in the cynicism question, is, is the meaning of the word democracy. Um, you know, what, um, what has happened to the meaning of that word um, before 89, during 89, and then now after? Um, uh, you know, I don't think there's one answer to this. It's a different in different countries, but the, um, there's a whole lot of cynicism about what democracy can do, obviously, now, and that the young democracies um, of Eastern Europe um, uh, are now seeing that democracy can be incredibly bureaucratic. It can be, um, in a sense, locked down in um, sort of that bureaucratic structure, which was something that, that Marcuse in 67 knew quite well, as did the students, um, that democracy can also then um, be extremely elitist and that it can be almost hereditary democracy um, in, in various senses of hereditary. Um, and that that, um, that sort of ossification of the democratic form um, is, is something that I think people are, are now experiencing um, and then trying, trying to, populism as a response to this in some kind of strange way. Um, what, um, one of the reasons I used Alexis de Tocqueville um, quite a bit um, in the book, trying to figure out what civil society meant um, in Eastern Europe um, through Tocqueville's French perspective on America was that he, of course, is concerned about the, the um, all of the forces within democracy that lead to bad things, not good things. Um, and he's you know, incredibly pessimistic at the end of that book. But the one optimistic point is his 
idea of civic associations and associationalism that is outside of both the state and outside of the economy. Um, so whether there is a possibility for people to gather together in a non-economic way where they're not subject to all of the forces of either a communist system or a capitalist sort of neoliberal system and whether um, then there is a, a possibility to organize outside of the state apparatus, which might be the sort of anarchist emotion <laughs> um, that we referenced earlier. So that if there is, um, it's in those locations, if you can find them, and they're going to be different in every country, um, where there, I, th I think there might be sources for optimism. And I think for Marcuse, a lot of that was artistic as well, which, uh, which is, I think, why, why this conference also includes films and novels and the rest. And um, there was something about an artistic production um, if you think of Plastic People of the Universe, the band in Czechoslovakia that was at the center of many of the dissident ideas, that's one example, right? They're, they're an artistic group trying to confront the authority. Um, yeah. So those are a few but 50 things. years along the line, um, even regarding the role of the arts, we're more cynical. We know right. now that yeah. the capitalist system co-opts even, even the rhetorical the art, yeah. rebellion of, of the arts, and, and yeah. we're left with very few sp uh, spaces, which leads me to, to your book, Mr. Lind, by, um, which basically shows a prime example of shrinking spaces um, through, of course, the figure, the figurehead of, of Orban. And at the end of the book, I thought to myself, I mean, where will liberation come from? It's, um, it is, I have since then written 45,000 characters for the English edition. Uh, which says basically you don't know how this regime will end. Uh, it is uh, <coughs> puts up, it, it deals with the campaign against George Soros, with the campaign against the Central European University. It does not quote the very characteristic statement of Orban said last this year, um, I think in his major speech in Romania, which is also interesting. The most revolting speeches are always delivered in the neighboring country. Well, in, that, great, in Greater Hungary. Yeah, and, and the Romanians leave, let it, so it's terribly interesting, more liberal. So he said, we thought, Orban said in 1989, this is the future, West is the future of our future. Now we know we are the future of the West. God should save us from that future, I can only say. Um, I think it is something very, very crucial that the basic, one of the basic tenets of Marxism or vulgar Marxism, <coughs> the pr primacy of economics, you know, Lenin, what is the primacy, politics or economic, that in Poland, economically most successful government in Eastern Europe lost partly through its own mistakes partly, or, or uh, you have then the, the situation for instance in Austria where there was a relatively successful economic policy of this government <coughs> and so on or in Germany. So I think perhaps that was the grave mistake of forgetting the psychological, popular, um, basic issues, nation, heimat, tradition, uh, role of the individuals. And uh, I think that shows the danger in which direction uh, Eastern Europe might go. I was absolutely shattered when Ivan wrote once that in Bulgaria, Orban is quite uh, popular. I mean, uh, this is uh, this is of course a fall back into the uh, into the most primitive forms of nationalism in an era of globalism, and that is of course a very dangerous situation. Absolutely, but I asked about the the options and visions for liberation. <laughs> so I. <laughs> you don't have any. <laughs> I, I can only say that I am always happy. Uh, I once talked about nationalism in Yugoslavia in Graz, and there were only eight people there, and six of them were Croat nationalists who were very upset <laughs> when I talked about Praxis Group and other things. But I think that and the other two were Esperanto speakers. Yeah, probably. and you know when I 
When I wrote my Kreisky biography, there was a reception, and there Wotruba, the great Austrian sculptor who was in Switzerland during the war, said that Musil had once a lecture, and there were seven people, including his family. So wherever there are more than seven people, I have a flicker of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, b b being Bulgarian, uh, we are not famous for optimism. There was a study being done uh, which was trying to compare the economic, the GDP per capita, and the levels of optimism. And the title in The Economist was The Optimist, the Pessimist, and the Bulgarians. Because <laughs> Bulgaria shows the biggest kind of a deviation from this. But I do believe that there is something in the work of Marcuse and Frankfurt in general which is going to become interesting, again, very much concerning this story about democracy, authoritarianism. And this is the role of technology. This is? The role of technology. Because for a long period of time, the idea was that all these technological revolutions, they are kind of a natural allies of opening of societies. I mean, you have all these stories about Twitter revolutions, about this, about that. And now, more and more, you discover three things. That first, in order for democracy to function, you need a public space which is not just a combination of a civil discussions between like-minded groups who are not interested in each other. Secondly, and this is particularly clear in the case of China, you can see that the technologies, and particularly big data, are managing to kind of minimize two of the most biggest problems for any authoritarian regime, basically access to an adequate information of what is happening in society. Because you can have a police state, but police state distorts. Police has its own interests. So from this point of view, the more police you have, the least you know about what is happening in society. Now with the big data, uh, basically you start better to understand where society goes. And strangely enough, in the case of China, you are not going to be sanctioned if you are going to write a negative blog exposing certain corruption uh, of uh, your local authorities you're going to be blocked when you ask your friends to go and to protest. So in a strange way, what is really sanctioned is a collective action. Mm. And from this point of view, you have a say, and by the way, the, the, level, the level of sanctioning is so sophisticated that this is scary. For example, if you are writing your blog, because of a certain keywords that have been uh, put in the algorithm, you're writing and you have the feeling that others have read what you have written. But certain type of blocks disappear automatically. This is the electronic. There is no people being involved in this. Simply when some of these keywords are used. So as a result of it, you end up in a society in which the technologies are totally changing the relations between the power and society. And plus, paradoxically, you don't need police anymore because people are informing on themselves on a daily basis. On a daily basis, people are saying in their Facebook how they feel. Their credit cards are telling basically what you buy. Uh, you basically even uh, has all this mechanism which was saying how much your uh, blood pressure is. Uh, so from this point of view, the destruction of the in individual as an autonomous body. As somebody, I know myself better than anybody else. This is now put in a question by technology. And I'm just going to give you one example which I read recently and make a strong impression on me. Uh, a father of a 14-year-old American girl who wrote very angrily uh, to Google because she started to get on her uh, Facebook and so on advertisement uh, for p things that are needed for the pregnant women. And three months later, it appeared that she is pregnant. So based on her choices, tastes, and so on, what she was buying, what she was liking, the algorithm signaled the system that she's probably pregnant. And for the commercial reasons, you basically start uh, selling this to her. So if this is the case, the fact that we know ourselves best is being put into question. And I do believe any liberalism starts with the fact that I could be right or wrong. But I am the subject. I know best what I want, what I want to achieve. And this is where it starts from. So from this point of view, I do believe that there is a bigger challenge which goes uh, beyond Orban saying this and that uh, in, uh, in Romania. OK, I can see this is a confederacy of pessimists. Um, <laughs> but just one point I want to make. Um, yeah. In China, you have a 1,000 small rebellions every year, as you have in India. So interestingly enough, societies that we regard as being more authoritarian at the moment have a higher degree of civil protest than the so-called 
democracies, especially of Eastern Europe, where you have very, very rare cases of, of serious um, rebellion. Um, but on the, on the final note, um, is, is there anything, when you look back 89 and the nearly 30 years after that, uh, alternative history, if you had a wish, what would be the one thing that you wish for had turned out differently? What would be the one thing that could have changed the course of what I feel now is a very sad state of affairs? I would say what Tim Garton Ash wrote in one of his pieces at the beginning, if one wakes up today, going back to sleep in 89, still hoping that things will work out better. Okay, so we should relive 89 we, we every year. Retro, yes. That's what <laughs> the, I can only see personally. Uh, and uh, I think I admire those people who knew everything always. I was, I was very surprised how the things went in Eastern Europe. Uh, in the sense that I, I didn't, ex I wasn't rosy in my articles and I was even criticized. But this phenomenon, for instance, in Hungary or also in Poland, are uh, for me the most terrifying examples that you simply can't predict. And uh, I think Hegel said once that the, the happy periods in the history of mankind are empty pages in the history. So I hope we go back to an empty page, but it will take some time. Um, I, I think the topic of history is a good one to end on. Um, I think what, what you read in the texts of the dissidents um, is a self-consciousness about history, to use very Hegelian terms, of um, being aware that they were, they were making history um, and coming to that awareness at a certain point in time, but also becoming aware of history by rereading their own histories differently. So by rereading not a Marxist history, but a nationalist history was part of how they motivated themselves, um, which shows that there is a flexibility and a, and a change in the way we actually read certain historical moments. Um, Marcuse also writes about this in some places. So that in you know 1992, um, you wrote the history of 1989 in one way. In 2014, you write the history of 1989 in another way. Um, I think one point of optimism to end on is that, that yes, 1989 is now being written as a historical moment with, with a lot of nationalism and perhaps a lot of pessimism in it, um, but that there, um, as times change, the writing of history does change, um, so, so that there could be in another decade or two a different reading of 1989 that comes out in, in a more sort of healthy political um, narrative, um, so, that, so that, the, that, that again, the good parts of 1989, right, to relive it again and again, um, actually will happen. I mean, that's what historians do, um, to look back and to rewrite history. <coughs> and I think activists and politicians also look back to history to rewrite it. And it's actually much more open um, than we assume it is, right? Um, and so that the, those rereadings is, is some point of, point of optimism to go forward. Listen, it's, it's also tricky because what we believe that if we have done differently, we don't know how it was going to end anyway. Uh, so from the, but I do believe that on the level of principle, there is one thing that I find quite important for any type of maximizing human freedom, and there is, there should be alternatives. These alternatives can be stupid, fake, others. But in a certain way, this is how people are going to to realize the understanding of subjectivity. 1989, if it has an utopia, it was the utopia of a normal society. For example, the word experiment was a dirty word. Uh, we believe that the only thing that you should do is simply to imitate the Western societies because this is what you want to be, a normal society. But imitation, even when it's successful, produces resentment because you never own the success. In a certain way, every Body, somebody else is going to tell you how successful you are. And I do believe from this point of view, listen, even the fact that you have this crisis, they have a positive effect. Because as I said, of course, Mr. Kaczynski and others, they're touching on real things. For example, they're touching about expectations that didn't went there. Uh, you don't know. Because in a certain way, what I was shocked was 
Even societies who believe that they're very successful, when they start giving advice to others, they normally advise them to do what they have not done themselves. I'm just going to give the example of West Germany. When West Germany went basically to reform the East, basically they said, we did very well, I mean, for the last 50 years. Uh, and you expect that they're going to tell to them, so you should do how we did it. But they said, immediately go to denazify. This is not what West Germans did. The first 20 years, this was not, I mean, particularly after the American. But you basically want to do what you have not done. What you believe that should be better, in more or other terms. So from this point of view, the paradox is that even when certain societies believe that they are successful, they are ready, very rarely exporting their own success. They are always exporting what they do believe they should have done. By the way, this is interesting that the welfare state was not something that Western Europe was exporting to the Eastern Europe after 1989. So from this point of view, no, it was the it's, shock it's, therapy. Yeah, exactly. So from this point of view, I do believe having an alternative probably is good, even if we don't know how good the alternatives will be. Well, I'm only the moderator, but if I can also voice a wish, I wish we had had a real revolution. I wish we had had a real revolution, even if it had been bloody. I think that the blood of peace, in the case of Bulgaria, which I know best, um, in th the cost of peace turned out to be higher than the cost of a bloody revolution. So this is um, my Thanks to you all. Thank you very much for a very engaging and very interesting discussion. Um, just to mention your books again, because I, I learned a lot from all of them. So, uh, sorry, I have to check on, on the title of your book, but it's rather lengthy. Philosophy and Dissidents in Cold War Europe. Um, the last book of um, Paul Lentwey is uh, in German, Orbans Ungarn. But Ivan, you mentioned that you saw it in, did you see this yeah, one in, yeah, yeah. in English in all the bookstores? What is the English title? Uh, Orban, Europe's new strongman. Okay, Orban's, Orban, Europe's new strongman. In German, Orban's Ungarn. And um, Ivan, Europa Dämmerung after Europe. Um, this is by far the cheapest book. <laughs> this is easily available. Wow, I must say your book has been it's um, far too expensive. <laughs> it's it slightly was. expensive. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you very much for coming and listening to us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.